So this is a very exciting night for Cooper Vision and Cooper. For us, it's, it's a, a night we've been anticipating for about four years. Four years ago, we launched the My Day Sphere. And when we uh, asked the audience questions, the first question that was asked was not how much is it, where are the fit kits, fit sets, it was when is the Toric coming out? Well, four years later, the Toric is here. The most anticipated lens, certainly from Cooper Vision and from what we hear out in the market, perhaps one of the most anticipated lenses in a long time. Tonight we have two guests, um, one that you'll be familiar with and one that you, are, you will be familiar with by the end of the evening. I'd like to start the evening off by welcoming Joe Tanner, our Professional Services Manager. Thank you, Joe. Thanks, Greg. And, uh, I'd like to add my welcome too to everybody. It's uh, terrific to see such a such an excellent turnout um, on a on a Tuesday evening in winter. Um, thanks very much for um, honouring us with your with your attendance to hear about this this, this product. And uh, I'm very much the um, the snack before the main course, which is Steve. So I'll do my best to um, to cover the bits I need to do, and then um, we'll be able to enjoy the insights that only really are. Um, are, are a real chemist can bring to, to contact lens technology in a, in a material chemistry sense. Um, housekeeping, 4.5, up to 4.5 CPD points uh, for this evening. So Okay, so I'm going to talk about um, where we find ourselves uh, with one day lenses and one day toric lenses in particular, and then also talk about uh, the design of the lens. And as Greg was saying that uh, um, we're very fortunate at Cooper Vision, thanks to people like Steve and our R&D group, we've been blessed with a stream of, of wonderful new products for quite some years now. And, uh, and, uh, and, and, thanks, to, and thanks, to, um, uh, thanks to that group, we are frequently gathering here in these, uh, these, these, these situations, typically once a year, but in fact, we were all here just a few months ago, weren't we, with Biofinity Energis, so the show rolls on. And, um, and so we, we we're able to sort of judge the excitement around these things. And as Greg said, you know, the, the anticipation for this product is very very high. There's probably some very good reasons for that. Um, and by way of introduction, I'd start by the fact that um, when I first came to Australia, because like the Deputy Prime Minister, I'm a New Zealander. Um, uh, when I first came to Australia, it was at the start of the century, and uh, and daily disposables were were really not very well um, used in Australia at that time. But in the last decade in particular, um, the, the adoption of, a, of the prescribing of one day uh, lenses by, um, by uh, Australian optometrists has really been um, taking it to, to, to really a, a leadership position in the world. There really aren't many significant contact lens markets which have um, the usage of one-day lenses as a significant proportion of total soft lens fits as, as Australia. So that's, that, that's terrific because um, so many practitioners say, even when we were back in these earlier years, that I'd love to use a one-day lens for everybody, but and there were various reasons for that. And gradually a lot of those reasons have, have gone away and, uh, and, and a lot of that is courses is excellent product development as well. So there we are, 62% is a magic number. It might even find its way to connect paper and pen. Um, and when we have had these events, for those of you who turned up at the um, Four Seasons Hotel last year to hear um, Stephanie Watson talk, and there were um, a terrific turnout that night, one of the things I did was, was survey the audience and, and, and did that at a series of events around the country. And in fact, this is, uh, by some measures, uh, the largest survey of optometric prescribing habits ever carried out because there's 906 optometrists involved in this. And it's just really asking a very simple question. The replacement frequency that you find yourself prescribing most often. And you can see that again, in, in support of that Efron survey information, we see a, a really a, an overwhelming majority of optometrists, 70% of optometrists, are saying, I find myself using a one day lens more than anything else. And then of course there are there's some other usage there as well. So Australia has certainly become a, a huge fan of, of prescribing one-day lenses, and that's good. Um, during the Energist launches, I, I asked the same question, and, uh, and I got the results for that as recently as a couple of days ago, which is why this is the CPD question, and the next one isn't. But uh, I thought I'd just update it, and it's actually stayed fairly similar. 
Um, and, uh, but we're still up around that, that sort of very high level. And you'd have to say that, um, that perhaps the, the only thing that's stopping that 71 from becoming maybe 80% of optometrists saying that they use one day's more than anything else is probably buried perhaps in the toric lens area. That might be a part of this. Um, the other part of this, of this though, is a, is a very important development of the story. So embracing one-day lenses is obviously a good thing. They're convenient, they're hygienic. By some measures of peer-reviewed literature, they're the safest way to wear soft contact lenses. But if we look at um, the usage of materials, and particularly when we're talking about spherical daily disposable lenses, not only has Australia embraced the use of one-day lenses, but it's also embraced the use of one-day silicon hydrogel lenses. And that's got to be obviously even better still because we're dealing with all the issues that can be managed by replacing a lens on a daily basis and then augmenting that by having, um, uh, by using materials which are obviously highly permeable and, um, and exhibit very high levels of oxygen transmissibility such that the, the cornea is really receiving, um, in effect, pretty much the same um, metabolic environment as if, uh, as if it was not wearing a contact lens. So that's terrific. You can see that really um, that 73% uh, of the time people are tending to use a one-day silicon hydrogel. And that, again, is, is very much world leadership. Um, there are very few countries can say anything like this when it comes to the use of one-day silicon hydrogel. It's quite different, though, when we look at the individual brands, and what we can see there is that uh, thanks to you and people like you, um, a big chunk of that 73% uh, is, in fact, in a couple of CooperVision products, and not least the spherical counterpart of the Toric that we're talking about tonight, my day. So that's kind of nice, thank you. And um, we look at the Torics, of course, it's completely different, because there's only one, or at least until very, very recently, there's only been one one-day silicon hydrogel Toric, and that's our Clarity product. That's done tremendously well in the short time since it was launched, and again, at this earlier, at this survey earlier this year, you can see that 28% of the optometrists who attended those meetings around Australia were saying, I use Clarity One Day Toric more often than any other One Day One Day Toric. But clearly, we've got this big orange area, which is other One Day Torics, which are, by definition, all hydrogels. So we've got a real contrast between what's going on in spheres and, and what's going on Torics. Of course, this is at the front end. This is really what's tending to happen with patients that come through your door today, tomorrow, and, and, and across the week ahead. And if we think about the patients, the existing patients who've been fitted over, say, the past five to 10 years that we've had these one-day um, uh, one Torix, uh, obviously the overwhelming majority of them are in a low DK, low oxygen material. And to cap off the sort of summary of where we are in the marketplace, um, we'd say that not only are one-day lenses dominating and one-day silicon hydrogels dominating in spheres, but not yet in Torix, it's what this evening's all about, I guess, we can see that out in the marketplace, um, and this is really um, data from, coming from the manufacturers of the contact lenses out to the, uh, out to the optometry practices, we can see across the last three, three years that the contact lens market over, in, in total has been growing at a pretty good clip, actually. That compares quite favourably with other parts of, of uh, optical retail. And so we can see we're sort of going at this sort of 10, 8, 12% rate. But when we look at the daily disposable contribution to that, it's, it's basically running at double. So daily disposable lenses are, are dominant and they're also growing um, much faster than the rest of the contact lens market. Um, however, again, we, we use this contrast to set up this, this evening of what's going on with one day Toric lenses. And if we think about firstly monthly and two weekly Toric lenses as a proportion of all monthly and two weekly um, products, so that includes the spheres, then we can see that we've got about 30% of the volume of the lenses. So this is, you could really equate this to patients. About 30% of the patients fitted with monthly and two weekly lenses get Toric lenses. And that's not far off the theoretical calculation which. Um, Efron and others have worked out is somewhere around 35, 36% perhaps um, might be the optimum um, uh, prescribing of these lenses if, if astigmatism is present in the population um, as, as surveys have indicated. Um, but when we look at what's going on with, with one day torrents, of course, it's much, much lower. So by and large, 
one day Torex are a very, relatively speaking, small part of the market. And of course they're, they're, they're small because um, until recently there hasn't been a lot of choice in terms of one day silicon hydrogels. Parameters have been constrained. Um, and, uh, and of course one day lenses do cost a little bit more than monthly and two weeklies and one day Torex cost a little more again. So we're talking about a very premium part of the market. In fact, arguably you'd say that patients wearing one day Torex lenses are, are, are really paying as, as high a price for contact lenses as, as, as anywhere is out there. So that's where we are. We have a terrific one day market here. Uh, it's, it's highly skewed towards silicon hydrogels, but in the one day Torex area, we've got some, some, some way to go. And this is important because um, astigmatism um, is actually quite uh, closely linked to the bane of contact lens wear, I suppose, the dropout. And, uh, and if we look at this, um, this is from some work by Graham Young, Jane Bays, and co-workers in the UK, but I'm sure it's, it's very similar here. And, uh, and what they divined is that really nearly two thirds of, of patient dropouts have uh, astigmatism of at least 075 diopters in, in, in one eye. So there's, there's definitely a, a, a vision component to drop out that perhaps is not always as fully recognised. Dryness and discomfort gets a lot of press in this area. But, but vision really is, is perhaps more significant than we've thought. And there's other, there's other research into this area of dropouts which, which would go to support this. So we definitely want to be able to correct these patients um, as often as we are doing so with uh, monthly and two weekly lenses. So let's talk about the lens design. Now at one level, um, we thought all we needed to say is this is the Biofinity Toric design, enjoy. And, uh, and, and of course that's, um, that's true, and, and, we, and we hope you do. But, um, but then we realised, well, um, Biofinity Toric is, is, is a relatively new product, I suppose, but it was 2009, if you're paying um, attention to the slides at the start, where we went through the cavalcade of Torics that Cooper Vision's brought to market over the past 20 years or so. Um, so it's, it's something that, uh, if you're a young optometrist, um, you wouldn't have been around when it was launched. So um, hopefully you're using lots of them, but, but you, you missed out on the, on the party at the start, which explains it all. So let's talk about um, uh, the design a little bit. Well, firstly, just some principles. Um, as we know, Torix have to be rotationally stable, and that's largely achieved by interaction with the, with the blink um, uh, and, and the forces that are generated by that blink. Um, Thicknesses are controlled in certain ways. Designers take different approaches to this to achieve that rotational stability. And we would say that um, uh, gravity doesn't really come into it all that much. And there's some, uh, some, some really quite teasing evidence of this, not least um, torrent lenses have been worn in space quite successfully um, uh, quite a while ago. And, uh, and way back when, uh, so this is back in the early 1980s, where if you're a young optometrist, you weren't even born. Maybe your parents weren't born. But um, this is going back a long way. And this, this chap, Mike Kilpatrick, who's got one of the most misspelled names in optics, um, who has got a, a wonderful practice in the, in the spa town of Bath in the west of England. Um, but he did work for a company called Titmus Huricon um, in the UK for a while. And he demonstrated quite uh, eloquently that, uh, elegantly that if you stand on your head wearing toric lenses, um, they still orientate just fine. Um, so uh, gravity's not all that big a deal. But um, we certainly need to do that. We certainly need to use design features because if you look at a spherical lens on an eye, um, it will move. It will move over the course of a day. And so you probably don't blink this fast, but this gives you an idea of just what happens um, when a spherical lens with no stabilization features is exposed to the, the, to the um, forces that are generated by, by, by eyelids. And sorry if that's sort of quite troubling. We should probably be giving the flicker warning, shouldn't we? But anyway, let's move on. Um, Michael Collins up at QUT has done some wonderful stuff with cameras that they now uh, use in cricket matches to show people hitting cricket balls in very slow motion to classical music. Don't know why they always use classical music, but um, this is neither blinking at a thousand frames per second. And you can see that it's, it's a complex action. The top lid is coming down and perhaps a little bit in towards the nose, but the bottom lid in particular is very interesting because it's largely a sideways motion. And so these are the things that um, are a challenge to contact lens or toric lens designers in particular when you're trying to stop a lens from, from twisting um, on, the, on the eye. So a lot of approaches have been tried over the years. They've given sort of unusual names, um, interesting names at times. 
um, and they look like this. But effectively, they're all trying to do the same thing, is, is create some sort of interaction with those li blinking forces to produce rotational stability. And whatever you do, whatever design approach you take, uh, one thing that is always true with toric lenses is they're going to be thicker. They have to be thicker than spheres because we've got these areas to generate these, um, these stabilization uh, properties. And we can see here that typically we, we are often getting up to thicknesses of 0 0.3, 0 0.4. In some designs, you're even 0.5 or more. And of course, they can vary with prescription and, and, and uh, other, other aspects of the design. So of course, we're, we're dealing with quite dramatic T values when we're thinking about oxygen transmissibility, or DK over T. So thickness increases, and therefore, a silicon hydrogel material, of course, becomes important. So how do the designers go about stabilizing these things? Well. Um, Briefly, this is what you might call the classical approach to it, and it's really based on a circular motion, given that most contact lenses are, even when they're molded, life starts for the mold as a, as a, as a circular lathing action. And so, understandably, sort of offset approaches and others were tried, so we end up with designs that classically have looked like this. Um, but that circular coordination design, as it can be called, does have some really distinct drawbacks. And for those of you who have used a lot of toric lenses over the years, you'll know that um, there's probably nothing more frustrating than a toric lens that doesn't behave, or doesn't behave like the last one in particular. And, um, and this is why. And it's because you're using an approach that's really devilishly difficult to keep everything consistent, and more importantly, to have things exactly as you wish. So we can say that we have to have multiple offset contours to generate those rotational forces, but in creating those thinner and thicker zones, we can't really optimize them in the way we'd like. We, we, we have to uh, effectively go with the flow, and so some of the thicknesses are greater than we ideally want, and some of them are thinner. And keeping everything symmetrical about a vertical midline, which is critical for lenses not to twist a long way, um, is difficult with this approach. And so we get uneven interactions, orientations are less predictable, and significantly, the whole orientation system can vary with the, with the prescription. So you have a patient, you need to adjust the sill axis, and lo and behold, you do that, and then the lens orientates in a different place, and you end up chasing your tail. So quite some time ago, we took a different approach. And this, in a simple sense, is the Cooper Vision way of doing it. So we have the technology, as they say, in the best, um, in the best science fiction movies, um, we have the technology, and we call this you know, an optimised geometry approach. So this way of using Cartesian coordinates, what this really boils down to is specifying things not in a circular basis, but point by point, pixel by pixel, if you like, and being able to control the thicknesses exactly as you want. A lot of benefits flow from this. You can control um, the thicknesses precisely. You can control symmetry very, very well about the vertical midline. And importantly, because you can use all the available area outside the optic zone to generate stabilization features. You can get a lot of stability with a relatively thin design. So I'm not trying to tell you that, that, uh, that these lenses are, are as thin as a sphere, they're certainly not. But generally speaking, they are at the thinner end of the toric um, lens spectrum. And so that design technology that you've become, I hope, familiar with, with uh, Biofinity Toric is, is included, well, is exactly the same in the Mide, Mide Toric lens. And of course, this, this, um, this technology has done phenomenally well since um, it was introduced eight, eight years ago, and it's certainly the number one Toric product in this part of the world, and indeed in, in many other places as well. Some of the features of it, um, there's more than four, but we just highlight four here, and in fact, I highlight one with a big red arrow for some reason. Um, but uh, we refer to this, um, high degree of symmetry across the lens as being uniform horizontal ISO thickness, so ISO, you know, same, similar. And that is what leads to a lot of predictability. The surface being very smooth is important, as we'll see. This large toric optic zone, that's good because when you start to go to higher sills and if your optic zones on the back surface start to reduce, then vision can be compromised where sometimes flare can arise. Um, so although that doesn't really contribute to lens stability, it's certainly a critical part of the optical performance of the lens. And as, as you've seen, we take a great deal of care with this sort of pixel by pixel approach to control the thicknesses exactly and, and generate them exactly as we wish. 
So in simple terms, you can think of um, our optimized total lens geometry as starting with the basis of, 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 of a prism. As we know, um, prisms also are a bit like watermelon seeds, and if, you're, if, if you were looking closely at that Mike Kilpatrick paper, you would have saw, seen that he referred to watermelon seeds, and this is simply because they approximate the sort of squeeze forces you have when your lid um, blinks down across uh, a toric lens quite nicely. So you squeeze a, um, a, a watermelon seed, you can make it go a long way because they're thicker at one end and thinner at the other. And we get this sort of ejection going on. So what we want to do is, is be able to control that inherent force from the, from the thicknesses and, and, and the blink. You can think of the lens being something like that, but of course you then make it far, in a far more sophisticated manner as, as that point-by-point -point design. But here's a contrast between what we might say is that, that traditional approach and this um, Cartesian coordinate point-by-point -point approach, and you have this much greater control as a result. We're using, as I say, all of this area outside the optic zone, um, and that's why a lens like Biofinity Toric and you'll find Mide Toric is so tremendously predictable, incredibly stable, and uh, nearly always orientates where you want it. Smooth surfaces are important because if you are going to go to all the trouble of designing these um, stabilisation features, if the lid should have any difficulty in smoothly moving across the surface of the lens, it will not only potentially affect comfort, but it, it can certainly affect, again, the orientational uh, stability of the lens as well. So we put a lot of attention into making sure those, those relatively complex shapes on the front surface of the toric are um, very well blended, they're very smooth. And uh, if we look at um, the performance of my day toric, we've just got a comparison here to show you with um, a couple of the other one day torics on the, on, on, on the market. Now this is the part where I show you um, some results and, and our lens comes out better than the other guys. So if that sort of thing always causes you a huge problem, you can look away now. But um, it was done in a double blind study, honest, so nobody knew what they were looking at. And so this is just looking very simply at um, how lenses orientate when they go on the eye and settle down um, uh, at baseline. So just as after a short settling time, and you can see that Mide Toric, rather like its counterpart by a, by a stable mate, by Affinity Toric, has a very high proportion of the lenses settled within 10 degrees of six o'clock, and quite a few, three quarters basically, settle within five. So that's, um, that's what you really want, of course. Um, the specifications of the lens, um, we know that one of the restrictions, one of the factors that has stopped the growth of the um, one day market has been the fact that not a, a tremendously wide number of parameters have been available. It is economically a challenge to produce a one day lens in thousands of different parameters, which is what you start to think about with, with Torix. By Affinity Toric, for example, has over 4,000 variations in its off-the-shelf form, and then if you go to By Affinity Toric, you're starting to go up into past 10,000. So you're getting really, really large numbers. Um, and that's very difficult to maintain in a, in a, in a, for, for a one-day lens. But nonetheless, um, we've taken it further than we've taken it before, and, um, and as a starting place, um, we have uh, a specification that looks like this. So it's the My Day material, of course, hence the name. So Steve is going to talk in um, more depth about that. Uh, uh, it's an 86145 um, lens. We'll have a look at the spheres and sills and axes on the next slide. 0.1 millimeters. Um, that's pretty typical for a toric. Perhaps a little bit slimmer than most of them. But of course, this is what you really like to see: very high permeability and uh, and transmissibility values. Albeit we're just doing the usual thing and looking at the centre of a minus three lens. There isn't that convenient. It's nice um, high in transmissibility value. Um, there we go. Um, of course, we have the UV inhibitor. We think that's pretty important. All of our one-day um, lenses, all of our one-day silicon lenses have um, a UV inhibitor. Um, the starting parameter range looks like this. So um, uh, available right now, four axes, um, 075 through to minus 225. Um, and that's for all these minus powers up to minus 10. And you can see we've got a range of uh, 10 axes um, for the three um, sills that you use most often. And, uh, and you've got uh, six for the, for the 225 sill. 225 sill, by the way, when we look at our usage of Biofinity Toric, it's um, something like 5% of the sales or less. So, so most people are, uh, need an 075 or a 125 sill. Higher sills, you remember them, but they're relatively rare. Plus powers aren't available yet. Yes, you know, high probes always have to suffer, but um, they'll, they'll, they'll be coming. Importantly, this configuration, though, um, is 
such that when we look at all the bioaffinity toric lenses that leave Cooper Vision and go out to optometry practices in Australia and New Zealand, we see that this configuration here would cover 94% of the orders. So although we haven't got some of the oblique axes, we are enabling you to cover a tremendous range of the prescriptions that you are going to prescribe. So more than nine out of 10. The health of the eye is obviously fundamental. We have a philosophy in our R&D group, which is we let the eye decide which way it's gonna go when we're trying to um, uh, evolve new technologies. And, uh, and of course, we're familiar with these stories now, but of course, it always behoves us to, to pay attention to them because the contact lens markers, of, as I've saying, as, as I said earlier, has, al has always got this sort of bipolar nature to it. We've got the existing patients and we're trying all the new and exciting things on them. And then we've got the much larger group uh, of existing patients. So the new patients get to try the new toys. The existing patients, well, sometimes they do, and sometimes they don't because they're happy. They're fine, aren't they? Um, but when we look at the literature and the research, and who better to review it than um, Professors Des Fon and Debbie Sweeney, uh, Debbie obviously has probably even taught some of you, um, and they reviewed the literature around prescribing silicon hydrogels and one-day lenses um, at the end of 2015, and a couple of their conclusions. Um, there's no need to really put up with um, inducing hypoxia for any patient these days. There's very few situations when you can't prescribe a one-day silicon hydrogel, and now that you've got two one-day silicon hydrogel torics, um, then the opportunity to bring uh, complete oxygen performance to, to um, more of your patients is, is, is there. So we need to pay attention to that. And, and of course, their conclusion is this, it's very simple. Um, ideally, a one-day silicon hydrogel is where you should start. That's going to give the patient the best chance of successful long-term contact lens wear. And after all, as I'm fond of saying, um, as a living, walking example, I've been wearing contact lenses for over 30 years. And typically when you fit patients today, they're 18, 17, 25. How long do they want to wear them for? Well, decades, potentially for the rest of their lives. So on that basis, I think, you know, as, as healthcare practitioners, we are always going to try to start with the optimum physiological situation and um, you'd have to make a strong case for that being a one-day silicon hydrogel. Um, and when we look at what happens, I talked about the centre of the lenses, but when we look at oxygen transmissibility, and Steve's going to bring more to this, so I won't linger on this, we can see with these oxygen transmissibility profiles, basically greens and blues are where you want to be, those high D over T values, we're looking at whole uh, lens D over T profiles here uh, for low minus or mid minus and higher minus lenses. And you can see that when you go to something like a silicon hydrogel, this is a much, much different situation to when you're in, a, in the hydrogel area. So you're getting these sort of D over T values. These are averages here, averages. Um, and of course, you should always be concerned with what's the worst point. Um, and you can see that you know the, the low points in something like a mitre toric lens are still very, very good in terms of satisfying the cornea's oxygen requirement. Um, the lens, as I said, features a UV inhibitor um, and uh, mitre blocks 85% of UVA and 96% of UVB. We think UV blocking is really important. I mean, this is Australia, it's the skin cancer capital of the world. Unless you go to New Zealand, they claim that too, but you can have the Deputy Prime Minister. Um, and, uh, um, and interestingly, Australian practitioners think so too. I've been doing this question for the last three years, and this is moving, moving, moving every time. And this is now easily the most positive response in terms of um, saying that prescribing a UV inhibitor or having a UV inhibitor in a contact lens is you know, nearly half of the um, 378 optometrists I, I surveyed said that they considered that very important. And most of the rest said it was somewhat important. And then there's the 8% who had dinner and said, thank you very much, but I'll stick without uh, the UV blocker. So um, I'll wrap things up now by just simply saying, uh, getting some of the, uh, the boring housekeeping out of the way, but perhaps also the more interesting part, if you want to prescribe the product. Um, trial sets, plural, because there are three of them. Um, you can have uh, an 075, a 125, or a 175. If you want a 225, you can't have one. Okay. 
Um, and uh, we would recommend for many situations uh, having the 075 and the 125 because that will cover a tremendous range of potential prescriptions just from a trial set. Um, but if you have all three, you go even further than that. So um, um, they look like this. Um, if you've got acres of space in your practice and you don't know what to put there, pot plants aren't covering it, then, uh, then go for one of our, our full trial set um, arrangements. Um, Opti Expert, if you haven't got it on your phone, you should download it from um, Android or Apple places. Um, and that will shortly feature My Day Toric um, in there as well. And we have a, a, a nice wheel there that you may have picked up that, to help you um, sort out which parameters are available. So um, in closing, I'd say that My Day Toric um, is one of the um, products in our portfolio which also benefits from the fact that um, thanks to a, uh, a legal opinion obtained um, a couple of years ago now, um, every Cooperville product launched since 2015 has been optometry only um, across Australia and New Zealand. It's something we can't control for the world, but Mayday Toric um, joins the Clarity family and Biofinity Energis um, lenses like that as being only sold to the optometry channel. And so, well, thank you. Okay, good. You like that. Um, and, uh, and really that concludes what I have to say. So um, I hope that um, sets up um, uh, an understanding of, of my day in terms of what we are providing to you and, and specification and the design philosophy behind it and why we believe it really is the best thing you can put on an Astigmat eye in 2017. And um, what I'm going to do now is introduce you to my colleague, Steve Diamonte, and uh, I'm calling him Steve Di Diamonte rather than Steve Bio, which is here in front of me. Well, Steve's a, a really clever guy. Um, he's got a PhD, and, and although those of you who have got PhDs will, will know that in, in, the, in the academic community that means permanent head, head damage, um, but in fact, in Steve's case, it doesn't seem to have affected him at all. So Steve is, is really very much a professional, serious chemist. Um, he has a very interesting background that you can talk to him about in, uh, in other areas outside, outside optics. But as well as um, being a chemist, he also has uh, a master's um, uh, in science and engineering from uh, the University of California. And, uh, and he's got a bachelor's as well from uh, Carnegie. We were talking about the pronunciation of Carnegie, a great Scottish name, Carnegie Mellon University. Steve's been a really critical part of our research efforts over recent years, and material chemistry is his thing. For those of you who love my day, and obviously a few of you do, um, you've got him to thank for a lot of that development. Uh, he understands silicon hydrogel technology, I think, probably as well as anyone walking around on the planet today. Um, he's been with the company for uh, nearly five years and, uh, and, um, and is one of those rare researchers who's gone sort of really beyond his research brief and is, in my time with the company I've certainly seen Steve add a tremendous amount of knowledge to um, marketing and sales groups and indeed customer groups as well. So it's my very great pleasure to introduce Steve Diamante. Thank you, Joe, for that kind introduction. So let's get started. So I'm going to talk to you today about the development of material chemistry story of my day, the material. And you know, originally, I had this title um, as "Let's Make Contact Lenses Great Again," uh, but you know, Joe informed me that that phrase doesn't work as well in the rest of the world as it does in the United States. So I, so I changed it to something much more serious and much more professional. <laughs> So I'm really going to focus on the science behind the technological breakthrough that is my day. Um, those of you that have been in the optometry field uh, for some time know that when we brought out the biofinity material, it really broke the mold of what a silicone hydrogel lens could be. And with the my day material, we broke that mold yet again in what a silicone hydrogel one day material could be. And so I'm going to talk about how we achieved that. But first, let's start with innovation. Right, coming from R&D, that's our bread and butter. That's what we do. And you can define innovation in a lot of different ways. One way that's the most apparent to you as optometrists is new product launches. And in the last 10 years, 
Cooper Vision has been leading the contact lens industry with launches of new and differentiated contact lens materials in the monthly segment, the bi-weekly segment, as well as the one-day segment. And even with that, we don't rest on our laurels. Uh, so we know we had a very popular and successful contact lens material in Avera. And we knew we could do better. So we actually upgraded our own two weekly lens with all the knowledge we've gained over the past seven, eight years in silicon eye gel chemistry and came out with the new care contact lens. Um, we strongly believe at Cooper Vision, our development philosophy is that there is a best contact lens that we can come up with for each unique wearing modality. So we think a one month material requires different properties than a one day material. And so we try to optimize each contact lens material for that unique wearing modality. Um, we're not unique in that, uh, but certainly there's some other companies that don't share that same product development philosophy. So we talked about product launches, which is what you guys see, but really this is just the tip of the iceberg um, when you're talking about research and development. Because behind every product launch, there's a mountain of research programs. So looking to understand fundamentals of how silicone materials interact with the eye and what determines good wettability on the eye, as well as fundamental research that we do on developing new building blocks for contact lens materials. And so behind every product you see, there's blood, sweat, and tears of many different chemists and clinical scientists that have gone into making that product. And so I want to talk a little bit about what's enabled us to achieve this market-leading space of being the innovators in silicone hydrogel materials. And you know, we're lucky enough that we have some great core technologies. And so I'm going to talk about chemistry first because it's my love. Chemists are very clever people. They have a dear place in my heart. And so you're probably aware of some of these fundamental technologies that are part of our blockbuster contact lenses. So we started out with the PC hydrogels. Um, then it became apparent the value of silicone eye gel materials for ocular health. And so we developed unique materials utilizing aquaform technology in the case of Biofinity and smart silicone chemistry in the case of my day that really enabled us to make lenses uh, that solve some of the compromises of other silicone eye gel materials. And so to do that, we had to utilize our core skills. And one unique core skill of Cooper Vision is that we not only know how to blend together different chemicals to make a great contact lens material, but we actually know how to make unique silicone molecules from scratch in our labs. So in the case of Biofinity, and in the case of my day, we actually made totally new molecules because that's what enabled us to break the mold of what silicone hydrogel materials could be by starting from scratch. And of course, we have great formulation experts. And over the years, we've developed a strong understanding between the chemical structures we put into contact lenses and the properties that we get out of the finished product. Of course, we're also known as experts in lens design. Um, so our aspheric optics are well known. Joe talked a lot about optimized toric lens geometry. Um, and we've even had some new innovations in this space, such as digital zone optics uh, and our MySight contact lens. And that really comes from the people, having expert lens designers, ex excellent process innovation, so these materials don't stay in R&D. We can actually scale them up and manufacture them. And certainly not um, least clinical scientists. So we um, attract and poach the greatest minds in contact lens research. And you know we're shameless. We'll steal great talent from anywhere across the world. So you might recognize some faces um, from the Brian Holden Vision Institute. Uh, so we really look across the world for the best clinical scientists, chemists, and lens designers we can find. Because it's really our investment in our people in research and development that enables us to make the best contact lens materials we can. And some of you might recognize that face as well. Okay, so these people at R&D sound like really clever, you know, they sound really clever. So what can't they do, right? They can make contact lens materials, they can make these excellent innovative lens designs that are unique to the market. Um, they're continuing to come out with all these new products. 
So what we can't do is we can't fit lens, lenses on eyes. So that's where we depend on our partnership with you as optometrists, because from R&D we can produce great contact lenses. But without optometrists um, fitting them on patients, they'll stay on the shelf. And so it won't be possible for patients to enjoy all this new and innovative technology. And I think Joe made a great point um, that it shouldn't just be new wearers that are coming in that are getting the latest and greatest technology. Um, there's a lot of opportunity to upgrade existing contact lens wearers. Okay, uh, so another way to talk about innovation. We could talk about the single most important development in the contact lens industry in the last 30 years. And some of you might have a lot of different opinions on this. And Contact Lens Spectrum actually published an article on this in last year, September. And they interviewed a lot of prominent contact lens researchers, as well as contact lens practitioners. And interestingly, there were two, the top two answers, which won't be surprising to this audience based on your fitting behaviors, were the development of a frequent replacement product, particularly one day disposable lenses, and silicone hydrogel materials. And so Joe talked a lot about hypoxia and risk of hypoxia, and some of that leading research, of course, was done at the University of New South Wales. And um, I think Professor Nathan, Ep Nathan Efron captures it best when he says, the introduction of these silicon hydrogel materials has not only been a great benefit to patients, help avoid the complications of hypoxia, but also a great benefit to practitioners with having to spend less of your time to solve these former contact lens complications that were seen in the past. So, okay, so great. So one day disposables are one of the most innovative things in the last 30 years, and silicone hydrogel is as well. And what a great thing that we can put both of those together. Right, but there's been some debate recently about what oxygen transmissibility criteria we should use, because there's a few different numbers out there. And so with that question, I really like to look back at the work of Eric Pappas, who said that it does not seem unreasonable for a clinician to attempt to satisfy the highest oxygen criterion that available lens technology will permit. Okay, so the highest oxygen criteria. And so you're all quite smart, and Joe's informed me that you know that the DK over T that you see on your sales aid and in your blister packs um, is taken in the center of a, con a minus three diopter contact lens. And of course, that's the thinnest part of the lens. There's nothing we can do about that. That's the international standard that was determined. Um, but that really is a best case scenario. So at Cooper Vision, we didn't want to stop there. We wanted to see what was the real story. So what's the real oxygen transmission? And so Joe got the pleasure of showing those pretty oxygen maps uh, first. And but this is actually how we got those images. So we partnered with a company called Face Focus. It's based in the UK. And they actually have instrumentation that allows us to measure the thickness of a contact lens at every seven microns. Okay, and to put that in context, the thickness of an average human hair is 50 microns. So across the thickness of one of your hairs, they'd be taking seven measurements. So that's the level of detail at which we're able to determine the thickness of a contact lens. Now, of course, we know the DK or oxygen permeability of all contact lens materials because that's a published value. So taking this thickness map and the decay of the material, we can then create an oxygen map across the entire contact lens surface. And so when you do that, then you get the whole picture. And it becomes really clear of the imperative we have to not only fit new contact lens wearers in the healthiest material, which you're already doing quite well, um, but to move over some of these poor hydrogel wearers that are languishing uh, these existing wares that are languishing in hydrogel materials. Uh, you know, now of course Joe talked about it, this is very dramatic in toric contact lens designs because you have to have these thick stabilization features which can make the lens very thick. But actually even in spherical contact lenses, hydrogel materials cannot satisfy even this lowest DK over T requirement across the lens of any single power and across the power range. And with silicone hydrogel, because you're starting with inherently high oxygen transmissibility, you can do that. And so, of course, um, you guys already know this. That's why you prescribe silicone hydrogel. That's why we have that great data that Joe showed 
from Australia, um, this could be a really nice tool to use with patients to explain, look, this is why I want to put you into a new contact lens material. And um, here's a very visual look at the benefits. Okay, so let's get to technology. Um, so, you know, so when we started to develop my day, it was very clear there was a gap in the one-day contact lens market. The one-day contact lens market was full of hydrogels, and there was only one silicone hydrogel. And so we went out and asked consumers, what is it that you want in a contact lens? Um, because you know, if we were going to make a one-day material, we wanted to satisfy all wearers' needs, not just satisfy some of them. And so some of these things are really obvious, right? You, you hear these all the time. I want a, a contact lens that's comfortable at the end of the day. I want great value. Um, I want my contact lens to be healthy. One thing that was, that was a bit surprising to us and hadn't had a lot of focus is that it's very important for contact lens wearers that the lens is easy to handle. And in fact, we did some more digging on this and we found that the number one reason for contact lens dropout in the first six months is not poor comfort, it's actually difficulties with handling. So having a lens that's not only comfortable at the end of the day, and healthy on the eye, but it's easy to handle and easy to train new contact lens wearers is really critical for new contact lens wearing patients. And so, as a chemist, I had to look to what material properties I wanted to design the lens around. And so the first thing that we looked at was making an extremely soft silicone hydrogel material. And we thought this was important and I'll get to it a little bit later in more detail, but it was basically because you had this situation where you had very soft hydrogel materials and much higher modulus or stiffer silicone hydrogel materials. And so we wanted to change that. We wanted to make a soft silicone hydrogel. Of course, water content is important, and who vision is known for our naturally wettable technology, right? Designing in wettability from the beginning, from the molecular building blocks, so we have an optimal water content and natural wettability so we don't need coatings. And then finally, high oxygen transmissibility. And so, since I'm a scientist, I love to show graphs, right? We all, we all like graphs. And so this is pretty simple. So, in the y-axis, you see modulus, okay? And modulus is a fancy scientific way of saying how stiff or soft the contact lens is. So as this number gets higher, you're getting to a stiffer material. Of course, you're all very familiar with DK and what that means. And as you know, as you go to the right on this scale, you're getting to more oxygen permeable materials. And, and this graph really captures the compromise that was in the market when we started developing MyDay. You had soft hydrogel materials. Softness has, has been something that, that was going on. And with MyDay, in, in what I'll explain later, we were able to break through that compromise and really create a new material space where we could be both soft, like a hydrogel, but bring the silicone hydrogel advantages of excellent handling as well as excellent oxygen permeability. And so how did we do it? Of course, I like to talk about the chemistry. That's my favorite subject, and a big part of the technological breakthrough was the silicone chemistry and formulation, and that's what we call smart silicone. So that's what I'll be talking about a lot. But I do want to point out um, that the engineers had a big part in bringing this to a one-day modality. Because of course, to make a one-day lens, you have to make between 40 to 60,000 lenses per hour. Okay, so this is not only a chemistry marvel, this is also an engineering marvel. But I don't know enough about engineering to speak intelligently about how they did it, so. You just have to stick with the chemistry story. Um, and, you know, one thing we didn't change, and Joe talked about this a little bit, um, is the lens design, right? It has the same aspheric optics that people really like in Biofinity Sphere um, for you know, excellent visual acuity, and we kept around the edge design that we have um, across most of our portfolio. Okay, so a lot of people think chemists are pretty clever people. So some of you in the audience may be saying, how come it took so long for all these contact lens companies with all their chemists to solve this problem of silicone and wettable material together? Right? Why did this take so long to sort out? And um, you know, my boss at R&D is a very optimistic guy, so he calls this a key technical partnership. Right? You need silicone for breathability 
and the hydrophilic or water loving components to give wettability and comfort on the eye. Um, I tend to be more a pragmatist, so I call this a formulation chemist nightmare. Right? So this was my uh, my first day at Cooper Vision right here. So I've actually I've actually gotten younger as I've worked longer at Cooper Vision. We've gotten better at silicone chemistry. I've actually gained hair. Um, you know, it's, it's, and so the problem is is that silicone and wettable materials don't like each other. Right? And those of you that have been in the industry a long time know that. That's why so many of the early lenses had to be coated. Um, that's why there were some wettability issues with the early silicone materials. And so, you know, to make it real simple, it's like being at home trying to blend oil and water in your salad dressing. It's not going to work, right? Now, in a contact lens, that's going to give you this. And so, obviously, all contact lens manufacturers have found a solution to this problem because you don't get contact lenses that look like this, right? So everyone's found a solution. Uh, with our solution, we took a little different approach. So we actually started from the very beginning because we can make our own building blocks. And we blended together the water-loving hydrophilic material and the silicone that we needed for oxygen transmissibility at the molecular level. And so I'll go through that in a little more detail. Okay, so you can see that those magical red letters have appeared again. So, you know, there were really three key features of smart silicone chemistry that allowed us to have this technological breakthrough. And the first is starting with a long silicone chain. And we found out through our research that this is quite important because it gives you extremely efficient oxygen transmissibility. So this is part of what makes smart silicone chemistry smart. The idea that you can use less silicon but still get excellent oxygen transfer through the contact lens. Now what we did that was unique is onto this long silicone chain, we actually chemically stitched water loving groups onto that backbone. And so a really elegant way to mix oil and water would be to bind them together at the chemical level so they can't run away from each other. And that's exactly what we did with the building blocks of the My Day lens. So these molecularly bonded hydrophilic groups enable us to bring the optimal water content to the contact lens, and they allow us to have inherent compatibility between both of the components we need for a successful silicone lens. Silicone for oxygen transmissibility, water-loving groups for natural wettability. And that's how we bring natural wettability to this contact lens as well. All right, and then the third key feature, we're getting a little more complicated here and we're getting into chemical terms. Uh, so what makes this lens unique and enables us to have such a low modulus, which you'll remember is a measure of softness, is the low cross-link density. And so what this means is that because the molecules are inherently compatible not only with each other, but with the other water-loving groups that we put in the contact lens, we don't have to tie them together as tightly. Right? And so what does that mean? Well, you could imagine if you had a, a bunch of rubber bands, right, and you tied them together at multiple points, they'd become harder to stretch. If you tied them together, let's say, just at the end, right, you'd still have something that was linked together, but it would be much softer and easier to stretch. So that's what we've been able to do at the molecular level because we have an inherently compatible system. And so that's great. You know, that's really nifty chemistry. But you're probably wondering, well, what's the benefit that we saw clinically and what's the benefit that my patient's going to see from these features? Because um, at the end of the day, like Joe said, we let the eye um, be the decider in what's the material we're going to bring to market. And so with long silicone chains, this enables us to have excellent oxygen transmissibility. And so you're all aware of the many benefits of a healthier silicone hydrogel material. And one of the key benefits to a patient is clearer white eyes, right? Lack of limbal hyperemia. Um, the molecularly bonded hydrophilic groups, these are the groups I talked about, these water-loving groups that we stitched onto the silicone backbone. These give us a, a sustained water content. So we can have a high water content in the lens. We have water-loving materials 
throughout the lens, from the core to the surface. So we have the ability for water to be hydrogen bonded and to be held into place and to resist evaporation throughout the course of work. And so of course, um, that can lead to long lasting comfort for the patient. And then finally, this low cross link density. Um, it gives a more flexible lens and it's our softest ever silicone hydrogel daily disposable. And from a chemistry perspective, remember we were trying to make it easy for patients to move from the hydrogel lenses that felt soft on their eyes to something that was a healthier alternative. So we think this was a key part of making something that would feel soft on the eye like a hydrogel material to make that upgrade easy. All right. So I've taken you down to the molecular level of where we started with these unique building blocks that allowed us to have this technological breakthrough. Now I'm going to take us up a little bigger scale. So now we're looking at the nanoscopic level. So we're no longer looking at the molecular level. And so if you were able to have a really fancy microscope like some chemists and to zoom into this contact lens at more than 10,000 times magnification, this is the structure you would see. Okay, so what you would see is silicone channels running continuously through the contact lens and water and other water-loving groups surrounding them. Okay, and because this is so small, these features are smaller than the wavelength of light. That's why the lens appears optically clear. So these features are thousands of times, I talked about the thickness of the human hair. These features are thousands of times thinner than the thickness of your hair. So the two key differences that you can see that smart silicone chemistry enables if you compare the my day lens material to let's say traditional chemistry used in silicone hydrogel is first you can see that we have fewer of these silicone channels. This is because remember part of the smart is that we're able to use less silicon to still create a high level of oxygen transmissibility. And what that does in turn is it leaves more room in the contact lens formulation to add these water-loving hydrophilic groups, right? That give natural wettability, that give a high water contact, that give maintain moisture throughout the day. And in fact, the chemistry is so efficient that we actually only need 4.4% of silicon to achieve excellent oxygen transmissibility. And I'll talk a little bit about how that compares with other lenses in a bit. So you might ask, well, how in the world could they possibly measure that? Is this just something that someone drew up in a marketing room, um, you know, somewhere and said, this looks good, let's use this. But, you know, I'm going to show you something, but I know I don't need to because I've been told that uh, chemists are one of the most trustworthy professions, actually just second to optometrists. So I know I have a high level of credibility entering this room. but. I know also this is a technical audience that really likes to learn new things and see new types of measurements. So this is an, an artist's impression of reality. And of course, reality is always uglier than the pictures we draw of it. So these are the actual measurements that were done um, to look at this, what they call a bicontinuous structure. And so this is really cool. So because these features are so small, you can't use a normal light microscope to look at them. You actually have to use an electron microscope. And that enables you to see features that are thousands of times smaller than the human hair and smaller than the wavelength of light itself. And, and so what we do is we're able to see, to create these two-dimensional images which look at both the phases of the material, the silicone material, which is represented as the light structures, and then the water-loving hydrophilic materials, which are represented as dark. That's the contrast you get from this electron microscope. And then by a technique called tomography, which is similar to CT scans, you can actually stack these images on top of each other and create a 3D image of this nanoscopic structure of the contact lens material. So pretty cool, right? And so what this allows you to see is that we have continuous silicone channels running through the contact lens. That's part of how we get efficient oxygen transmission and of course, we have water loving materials continuously distributed throughout the lens, right? From the core to the surface. Okay. 
And so what does this lead to? So we wanted to kind of quantify because uh, you know you guys are really nice, but people in the United States sometimes are a little difficult. And they say, well, how smart is it? Do you have an IQ for this lens material? So we actually created an IQ. We created something called Effective Silicon Index, which actually lets us measure how efficiently we're using the silicon that we add to the contact lens. And I know people don't like math. I don't even like math as a chemist. So we made it a very simple equation. So we simply take the decay of the oxygen, or the oxygen permeability of the contact lens, and we divide it by the percent silicon in the contact lens, which we can measure by a chemical technique. And so what this lets us do is this lets us really compare apples to apples, because of course, all contact lens materials have a different decay. So we want to be able to compare like for like. And so we can collapse this all um, into this number effective silicon index. And so what you can see is that the my day lens has the highest effective silicone index of any of the one day silicon ideal materials. Okay? And so that's part of what being smart is. Being able to get more oxygen transmissibility with using less silicon. And so because of that, it has the lowest silicon content of any one day silicon ideal lens. But that's not what's special. It's what that efficient oxygen transmissibility allows us to do. It allows us to add more wettable materials into the contact lens formulation, giving us a higher water content, no need for coatings or adding other wetting agents, inherent wettability from the building blocks. And then like I've talked about, you can tell this is my favorite feature, it enables us to make a contact lens material that's incredibly soft. And so the technological breakthrough is really being able to meet all the patient needs without compromising. Joe talked a lot about UV. Um, UV protection has really become our standard for new contact lens materials. I think it should be the standard for all contact lens manufacturers for new materials. Uh, of course, high water content, excellent oxygen transmissibility, and a very soft contact lens material. So really an unmatched combination of everything that patients need. So, we talked about innovation in the beginning, and so I want to bring us back to where we started. So the ultimate contact lens. We talked about the two biggest innovations in the last 30 years of contact lens manufacturing, one-day disposable lenses and silicone hydrogen. And now we have the ability to have those two technologies together and with the low modules, right, to eliminate that last pushback of why people might not move into a healthier contact lens material. Um, and of course now, we have this contact lens material for a very soft contact lens material. So really an unmatched combination of everything that patients need. So, we talked about innovation in the beginning, and so I want to bring us back to where we started. So the ultimate contact lens. We talked about the two biggest innovations in the last 30 years of contact lens manufacturing, one-day disposable lenses, and silicone hydrogel. And now we have the ability to have those two technologies together and with a low modulus, right? To eliminate that last pushback of why people might not move into a healthier contact lens material. Um, and of course now, we have this contact lens material for astigmats as well. So delivering this outstanding softness um, for a wide range of wearers, using the next generation material that I took you through how we were able to create this from the chemical level. Um, and you know, we talked about high oxygen transmissibility for corneal health, UV protection, and most excitingly now in a toric with the optimized toric lens design. So it, it truly is everything a contact lens should be, both for sphere and for toric. And so with that, I'd like to thank you for your kind attention. And Joe and I will take any questions that you have this time.